Okay, folks, we're going to get going. Very good. Um, the usual uh, administrative announcements. Please remember to uh, throw away your trash after the talk and to recycle anything that you can recycle. Uh, if uh, you have a cell phone or something else that makes noise, this would be a good time to turn it off. If you have a noisy neighbor, turn them off too. Um, if you're taking the course associated with the brown bag, the uh, sign-up sheet's over there on the other podium, so please remember to sign that. Um, I'd like to make a pitch for next week's brown bag, which are going to be uh, preview talks for the visualization conference. Um, is there anybody here going to the conference who wants to make a pitch about the, or announcement about the conference? Go ahead, pitch away. So we have a bunch of papers. So uh, Alex Ender uh, has, I think, three papers. Um, and then the last one. Yeah, and Rahul has a workshop um, on business visualizations that he's organizing with some people. Um, and then we have a bunch of posters there, which is pretty exciting. Um, so we'll be kind of talking about that. Uh, unfortunately, John and Alex will be out of town next week. Uh, so you'll mostly be getting kind of poster previews, a little bit more than Alex's paper previews. Uh, they chose that date specifically so they could be around <laughs> I, I guess. Apparently it's also John's wedding anniversary. <laughs> uh, his wife's not so happy that he's out of town for that. But, <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, so we'll be talking about that next week. So it's going to be worth showing up. We'll have our touch screen down here, so we'll be doing some cool demos on that. Great, thank you for the pitch for that. And you'll be doing card tricks too, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, very good. All right, well, today's talk is uh, Yanni Lukisis, and because he's local, I'm gonna leave it to him to provide a fascinating introduction to himself. Thank you, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Is this too loud? Well, thanks for coming out to see um, somebody local. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about um, all things local. Um, I'm an assistant professor in digital media, for those of you who don't know me, and I direct uh, the local data design lab, which is a place where we are in the process of trying to rethink the relationship between data and place in contemporary life. Um, now, some of, the, some of you may not know that I was originally trained as an architect, um, which might give some indication of, of my interest in, in place, um, which has kind of uh, stayed with me throughout the years as I've kind of moved into new domains and investigated new things. Um, after I did undergrad in architectural design, I went into grad school to learn about computation. Um, but I but ended up doing, um, doing more social research there. I, I got involved in a program in science, technology, and society. I don't know if you all are familiar with that field. Um, and I did a lot of work on social studies of technology, and I'm gonna talk about that today. But these, these three things, uh, design, computing, and social research, um, are, are issues, are, are, are methods um, that I've tried to tie together in various ways and today I'm just going to share kind of one, uh, one of those kinds of intersections. Uh, this is, this is going to be a talk about, about visualization. Um, it's going to be a talk about data. And it's going to be a talk about social studies of work. Um, and this is, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show um, quite a bit more of the older stuff that, uh, you know, I was planning on showing some kind of more work in progress. But I realize a lot of you here um, hadn't seen some of the kind of oldie but goodie um, projects, and so I wanted to kind of share those with you and talk about how they have kind of led me into what I'm doing today. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a talk in which I'll try to show you how I use design as a, what I call a language for critical reflection. So um, a way for us to kind of look at and think critically about how work gets done in contemporary life, and particularly work with data. So it's not necessarily about the design of better tools for practice. Um, it's more the use of design as a form of inquiry. 
Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the use of visualization design for, for exploration. So this is applied to a particular kind of, um, kind of inquiry. Um, an engagement with um, the entangled transformations of knowledge and identity that we find in the contemporary workplace um, in, in all matters of uh, work engaged in, in with, with, digital, uh, with digital data. So there are a couple of parts to the talk. I'm going to start out um, giving a broad overview of what I call data trouble, um, how data complicates traditional um, modes of practice. I'm going to talk about the research questions that structure my thinking around this topic. I'm going to talk a little more about design as inquiry and what that means. Um, and, and then I'm going to show a couple of examples. I'm going to show a project uh, called Visual Apollo, um, which I apologize if those of you have seen it before. But maybe, you know, on the second time around, you'll, you'll glean something new. Um, and I'm going to talk about a project called The Life and Death of Metadata. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what, what my lab is doing now, where we're going. And hopefully we'll have time for questions. So I want to start out um, just to kind of pull you along this kind of full trajectory um, from my, my kind of early interests as an architect to what I'm doing now. My early, my early work and, and a book that came out in 2012 about that work um, called Co-Designers, Cultures of Computer Simulation in Architecture is really about uh, transforming relationships in, in the practice of architecture and particularly about how architects and engineers work together and how that relationship has changed over the course of the 20th century, particularly um, as it's been kind of reshaped in relationship to new tools for simulating light, simulating structures, simulating environmental conditions in buildings. Um, it's, 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 really, it's a work that's organized around the accounts of designers um, that are in competition to try to redefine what architecture means in a new technological era. Um, and these are, these are practitioners who are really looking to simulation to help them, um, to help them identify, help them sh shape new roles for themselves um, and new relationships that can bring them um, greater acceptance uh, within their work, greater professional acceptance, but also greater control over design. So I want to start out with a story from that book um, that helps to, to kind of get to this issue of data trouble. So this story comes from an American architecture office uh, where uh, two architects are working together, Morris and Thorndike, uh, a master, what we might call a master architect, and his apprentice. Um, Thorndike, the apprentice, sits at a computer while Morris stands behind him. Um, they're looking at um, a screen, but not necessarily seeing the same thing. Um, Thorndike, the apprentice, has constructed a digital model of a library using a program called CATIA, a 3D modeling program that some of you might be familiar with. Um, his, Thorndike's understanding of this model as he builds it, it's an embodied understanding, it's an internalized understanding. As he's constructed this model, he's learned about um, its various elements, how they, their, their logics, how they fit together. Um, Morris, who stands behind him, has been trained to think with a pencil uh, and cannot operate the modeling system that his office uses. He's working at a distance, a remove from this model. He can only talk about the lines, the surfaces, the colors that he sees on the screen, at best really a snapshot of the design. Um, whereas Thorndike has uh, a deeper sense of the, of, the, of the structures that went into creating it and how it might be um, iteratively modified. So this example starts to show us how sharing a screen doesn't necessarily mean sharing a vision, right? Um, moreover, although Morris is calling the shots um, in the office, he's the principal of this office, one of his colleagues actually remarks that he's no longer the one shaping space. So you can already see that there are kind of professional transformations at play here. Uh, the next short story that I want to I want to talk about is from an operating room. Um, this is an image of an operating room in Boston at uh, Mass General Hospital. This is not the operating room um, that I'm going to talk about particularly, but it, but it gives you a sense of the kinds of things in in the room. Um, you have you know of course. Um, 
the bed where the, the, the patient lies, but you also have um, lots of screens for carrying representations of data around. You have uh, cabinets with supplies in the background. Um, it gives you a sense of this environment. Um, so after moving on from, from examining changing relationships in architecture and engineering, um, one, of the, one of the areas I looked at was, um, uh, was, was um, cardiac surgery. And this is, a, this is also a change from, they don't use 3D models in cardiac surgery, but they use quite a bit of data. So it's really a shift from looking at the contemplative use of, of modeling to a, more of a real-time reliance on, on digital systems. And this is, comes from work I did, ethnographic work I did, where I um, stood in the operating room and I observed operations unfold sometimes for six or eight hours. Um, so it's very, these are very long processes. So one morning, Lorenzo, um, a pseudonym, um, the chief of cardiac surgery at this particular hospital, um, was working with an ad hoc team to perform what's uh, often known as a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. Um, now often these teams um, come together for a particular operation. Everyone in the room hasn't necessarily worked together before. Um, relationships are, are developed on the fly. Um, but the idea is that there are kind of procedures and routines and traditions in place that help to uh, help people develop expectations for um, how to interact with one another. So as part of this uh, bypass graft operation, um, they actually have to stop the patient's heart and they reroute um, their blood through a heart-lung machine, which um, circulates the blood throughout the body, oxygenates it. Um, it kind of does all the things that the heart, um, the heart and lungs would do normally. Um, because they want to stop the heart so they can actually perform surgery directly on it. Um, and in order to do this, they administer what's called cardioplegia. It's a kind of potassium-rich solution that paralyzes the heart. Um, so Lorenzo is, is doing this kind of careful, what we might almost describe as craft work, um, but he's, he's, he's um, focused on the data on one of these screens. He's looking at an electrocardiogram, an EKG, and the, the cardioplegia has been administered and he's, he's waiting for that line to go flat to show that the, the heart has stopped, um, which you wouldn't expect um, surgeons are kind of waiting for that to happen, um, but in certain operations they are. Um, later in an interview, he, he reflects, he says, I was looking at the screen and the heart was not stopping. If I see that the EKG line doesn't go flat within a minute, I start worrying. So he's worrying, quite ironically, that the line isn't going flat. Um, there's a problem in the room, but the evidence isn't on the screen. Um, one of the interns, it turns out, his first year out of, out of school left a valve open on what's called an octopus catheter that helps to route the cardioplegia um, through the heart. Um, and the cardioplegic solution, along with the patient's blood, which are kind of being circulated through this uh, heart-lung machine, are actually bypassing the heart and spilling out onto the floor below the surgeon's feet. Um, because this, you can imagine what this kind of catheter looks like. It looks like an octopus, and it's basically going through the wrong tentacle. Um, the first to notice is actually one of the observers that I'm working with in the room, and she, she tells the surgeon in time to advert a disaster. The patient was fine, didn't suffer any ill effects, and Lorenzo dubs it a near miss. Um, so these stories point to a conflict that I like to talk about. Um, on one hand, data support human work. However, data can also obscure or mislead. Um, they can fail to reveal what's invisible, but salient or simply distract from what's present at hand, like the, the blood pooling below your feet. Um, digital interfaces are these days troubling what we think of as traditional objects of attention. Um, traditional roles and relationships, as well as kind of basic um, values and norms that go into this kind of work. Uh, new kinds of data change what it means for experts to know across disciplines. Um, older virtues um, that are kind of embodied by um, 
practitioners like architects and surgeons, um, virtues of autonomy, intuition, improvisation, kind of what we might think of as pre-digital virtues, are coming, com coming into conflict with um, aspirations for um, new virtues, for automation, for predictability, for control, right? Um, Lorenzo and Morris are living through a difficult transition, uh, balancing between these, uh, these ideals. So they have to be attentive to digital representations as well as the physical space around them, right? They have to be information managers in addition to managers of people and technical systems and mechanical instruments. Um, they have to learn to balance their reliance on digital data with other ways of knowing through experience, through their senses, and through direct forms of communication. So there's a lot that you have to um, manage, and data are just becoming another thing um, on your radar. So I'm actually finding, and this is what my work addresses, I'm finding that we don't really have good languages for describing, reflecting on, and critiquing these new hybrid ways of doing work. And this brings me, oh, well, here's you know, data trouble, um, that data are troubling traditional objects of expert attention, professional roles and relationships, and uh, what we might call epistemic values and norms. Um, how do we know what we know and what does it mean to know in architecture or in surgery? Um, and this brings me to, to some of my, the goals for this research. Um, there, and th there are two goals. The first is theoretical, to illuminate the way that data shape and are shaped by the social material context of contemporary work. How do we understand um, data's place in these kinds of environments that I've described? The second goal is a more applied one, to really to work with these practitioners, to engage them as partners in exploring alternative or augmented roles for data, but also for skilled people. Um, more than ever, we need skilled interpreters of data, um, skilled actors responding to data. Um, and, and that requires a special kind of relationship to data. And those relationships were still, are still being worked out. So uh, people have long sought to understand uh, the co-evolution of workers and their technologies. I don't know if anybody is familiar with this film. Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times, um, kind of you know, finding his own place in the machinery of kind of industrial work. Um, but there are all, there's a long tradition of, of scholars doing this also, from Marx to Mumford, Hutchins to Schwartz-Cohen. Um, many have written compellingly about how knowledge, perception, and skill are situated in technological regimes of work um, that, that go way back. Um, many of those attempts, including chaplains here, incorporate visual representations. Um, <coughs> In, in the description and the evocation of, of work processes. Um, more recently, a number, of, uh, a number of scholars in STS, in science, technology, and society, um, have pointed out a, a shift. People like Wackman, Turkle, Bowker, Starr, you might recognize some of these names, um, are noticing that contemporary work relies on digital data and digital processes uh, for collecting, managing, and interpreting it. Um, and, and, and it's leading to new practices that we don't fully understand. So in my research on architecture and on surgery, and more recently, as I'm, I'm gonna share today, in spaceflight, um, in botany, in journalism, in, even in real estate, um, I tried to come to, t to terms with unique challenges that are presented by the incorporation of, of digital data. I believe that work with digital data is materially, spatially, and temporally distinct from the kinds of work we did before. Um, but to address the new challenges around data, we need new ways of capturing that work, new ways of, of seeing the, the context of contemporary work. And this is what brings me to design as a form of inquiry, and more specifically visualization. Now, in my own, you know, I don't know if I'd call it a home field anymore, but my field of origin, architecture, we've used visualization for centuries to think about data. Um, this is, here's uh, a drawing from a method that Gaudi used called graphic statics to try to visually um, uh, determine the, 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 the structural needs of a bridge. 
Um, this is actually not a project by Gaudi, but Gaudi did use this, this method. And I thought you might be more familiar with Gaudi. Um, so what I'm, what I'm finding is that established ways of doing social studies of work, they're increasingly inadequate. Things like interviewing, things like observation, can't capture the scale, can't capture the substance of the digital. Um, we want to acknowledge the material presence of data in work, the sensor values, the records, the models, the images, the video, the audio, the text that kind of are streaming through our work practices, as well as interpretations of these data in their context. And I believe that we can design new languages of representation that help us to see work, to see data work um, in more effective ways. So as a first example, um, I want to share this project Visual Apollo. Um, this is a kind of turn to a data-rich event from actually the early history of digital computing. Uh, Apollo 11, the, Apollo, the, the first lunar landing. Um, this, was a, this was a job um, that was completed only narrowly in the wake of several um, data alarms, disruptive data alarms that went off um, in the digital guidance computer. And we know now, some of you might know um, a bit about this event, that those program alarms were actually inconsequential. Um, but the burden of monitoring them and interpreting them actually distracted the mission team at a crucial moment in the landing and caused them to kind of overshoot their original um, landing site and, and nearly um, forced them to either abort the mission or risk a fatal crash. Um, and this was an event that really foreshadowed the widespread use of digital systems um, in work and foreshadowed widespread public concerns about its integration into, into the work of, of, of people. Um, so this is a project that I did in collaboration with a historian uh, named David Mendel. He wrote a book called Digital Apollo, uh, I think back in 2008, um, that some of you um, might have seen, or if you haven't and you're interested in the Apollo programs, you should definitely pick it up. It's a, it's a fascinating page turner. Um, and this is the cover of the book, well, without, minus the title and, and, and the authorship, um, it's a recreation of what it looked like inside the, the lunar module. Um, so you can see there's a hand on the right hand side that says Armstrong on the sleeve, it's very faint. I don't know if we could turn down the lights a little bit in here. Are they over here? Do I have control over that? This? These things? This one? Oh, that's the shades. Oh, that button. Okay. Um, that, that's better, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so it was a fantastic book, but it was typical about, of how qualitative and quantitative sources are often handled independently in such studies. Um, so we wanted to retell the story of the lunar landing through data. Um, and sometimes I refer to this uh, project as a visualization, but it's actually kind of more than that, and I think you'll see why. Um, I've, started, I've started talking about it as a data documentary about the event. Um, so here is the, um, here's the text from um, Mendel's book that kind of sets the scene. It's July 20th, 1969, about 5 p.m. Houston time less than two hours before the LM, or lunar module, had separated from the command and service module, as the two flew in similar safe orbits around the moon, preparing for the critical descent. Then the LM, the LEM, as it's sometimes referred to, initiated its DOI burn for descent orbit insertion around the far side of the moon to bring Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin down from a circular 60 mile orbit to an elliptical one, 60 by 10 miles. The crew carefully monitored the burn, ready to cut it off manually if necessary, to abort it if it burned even slightly longer than planned. Michael Collins in the CSM Columbia was also watching, tracking by radio his range to the LEM. Everything was multiple, redundant, man-rated. At every turn, the astronauts were in the loop, from the alignment of the inertial platform to the PRO button. The final check was to be executed by the people with the most to lose. So this kind of describes the kind of rich human computer um, uh, you know, environment here where you have kind of people and machines, not just a person and a machine, but actually teams of people and machines kind of working together to accomplish this incredibly complex technical feat. Um, 
this is how the landing was portrayed in the book visually. So here you see the limb um, on its side. This is how, when it came out of orbit, what it looked like. Um, and it pitched over to land on the surface of the moon. We have some um, quantitative data here about the changing altitude and velocity, but not much. Um, the human, the, of course, the human relationships and interaction are left to the text. Um, it, and it also leaves out all this data. You can see here six, seven lines of data, um, labeled data. Um, that show on the left you have the mission time and hours, minutes, and seconds since the um, launch. Um, and then all kinds of data coming from the guidance computer. But we also have things like transcripts, um, audio, let's see, um, uh, two separate communication transcripts, two audio files, an image of the lunar surface, the records of two computer systems, um, the disk key with the display keyboard interface, and the AGC. Um, So the disky um, down, so up at the top in green, you can see the mission time, hours, minutes, and seconds. And then on the right, next to Armstrong's hand, you see the disky. That's, that's their interface to the guidance computer. Um, so let's jump out of this, and I'm going to launch an application. So this is, a, as I said, a project I did with David Mendel. I also worked with a, a research assistant, um, Francisco Alonzo. This is a project I did as a, as a postdoc at MIT, working with Mendel. Um, and, and Don Isles, one of the original programmers of the, of the lunar module, of the guidance computer, um, helped us out as well. He actually provided a lot of the data. Um, so here's the, the text that I shared with you earlier. Whoops. Let's, let's play that again. So here what you see is um, a range of sources all brought together and organized around the mission time. Um, you have, if I turn off, Let's see, let's get rid of the drown transcript also. So this is the team transcript. So this is all the dialogue between Aldrin and Armstrong and um, um, Michael Collins, who's in Columbia, which was the, the craft that was kind of waiting to take them back to Earth, and, uh, and Houston. And each dot is an utterance. You're not seeing, um, you're hearing, but not seeing, let's see, let's turn off the ground audio. That would make it a little further. For some reason, the team transcript is not. Um, so the size of the, the circle is proportional to the length of the utterance. So you start seeing the, you get a sense of the, the pace of conversation back and forth. Also, these lines show who's talking to who. Now, they're arrayed here on a, um, on a graph, um, uh, a timeline. So you have, um, in, one, in the horizontal dimension, you have the mission times. Um, remember I said hours, minutes, and seconds. And then in the vertical dimension, you have the altitude um, from the moon. So all the way from zero, but this is not just a linear um, graph. It's actually um, showing incrementally, it, 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 it advances kind of 10 times the distance each time you go back. So the, the first line is um, 10 feet away, then 100 feet away, then 1,000 feet away, and you get all the way to kind of 10 to the ninth feet from the moon, which is the distance of the Earth. So what it does is it allows you to kind of pack in a lot of detail up close um, near the surface of the moon while still incorporating what was happening at a distance. Um, now I can add in all these other sources. Um, let's see, there's an image of the lunar surface. So you have a sense of what they're flying over. Um, we have position two. You have, um, this is commentary. Some of it's from um, the, the book that Mendel wrote. Some of it is from interviews following on the um, landing. We have the disky, which had um, six registers. 
mode, noun, verb, um, and then these, these three um, kind of feedback registers. So noun and verb were inputs to the guidance computers, and the other registers were outputs. Um, then you have the, the pitch, um, which as you could see from that earlier drawing, the pitch was very important to understanding the, the process of the landing um, as it unfolded. Um, then I can add the ground transcript. So these are all the voices in ground control from the flight director all the way back to the surgeon who was monitoring the heart rates of the, of the astronauts. Um, and then I can turn on the audio. So it becomes a kind of interactive archive of the event that allows somebody like historian David Mendel to go in and examine different moments in this process and, and help to kind of narrate this event. So here you can you see the ground control going through these, uh, these checks that the flight director is orchestrating. I'm going to take, I want to take you to the moment where the program alarms start to go off. So there's Aldrin um, saying 12.02. So I don't know if you can see this, but down at the bottom in register one it says 12.02. So that was one of the first program alarms that went off. And they didn't actually know that the, the mission team on the lander um, didn't know what it meant. And they didn't know how to diagnose it, um, whether they should proceed or abort. Um, and they started turning to the, to the ground control team for help. So you can already see um, this kind of complex network of relationships and how certain kinds of work are offloaded by the mission team. Um, first, to their computer to kind of diagnose problems, and then uh, to, to ground control um, when they couldn't interpret the data that was coming back from the computer. It turned out that this alarm had to do with um, a problem with, a, with one of the power sources. And the, the computer was responding to it by actually just dropping all um, um, non-essential functions. So actually the computer was handling, had been really well designed, and, and it was kind of handling, um, handling the problem in its own way. But the astronauts didn't, do, didn't know that. And, and, just getting this feedback was enough to kind of distract them at an important moment. So you can see them. So he says, in ground control, they say, we're going that flight, are we going that alarm? So there's a lot of back and forth where they're discussing what is this, trying to figure out who can tell us what this alarm means. They're getting a little impatient. That's Duke, he's the liaison between ground control and the astronauts reassuring them that we'll go on that alarm. We're going to figure it out. So meanwhile, ground, the, the astronauts ask, because they're so distracted, and, and they're supposed to be actually monitoring um, features in the landscape to know where to bring the, the limb down. And so they ask ground control to monitor their delta H. I don't know if you, any of you know what that means, but it's... Delta H is the difference between the computed altitude and the measured altitude. And as you can imagine, if that delta, if that difference is too much, then you should start worrying, because one of those values is wrong, and you don't actually know how high you are above the lunar surface. So I'm just going to progress this al along. So here we have a moment where Aldrin is um, kind of narrating the descent, which typically happens you know, in any commercial plane, um, the co-pilot um, kind of does this kind of narration of the descent for the pilot. That's an interesting moment where Aldrin is saying, uh, he says, you're pegged on horizontal velocity. So he's, he's telling Armstrong that the, the needle in the velocity gauge is so far over to the right that it can't go any further. It's pegged. <laughs> On horse, and he's basically telling him not so subtly, well, subtly, that he's going really fast. He's supposed to be bringing this thing down. He's supposed to be landing it. And instead, he's, it actually looks like he's speeded up. And if you see in the pitch, there's a kind of crook there um, where Armstrong is actually um, um, pitching the, the craft forward, which actually um, uh, lifts it, you know, actually causes it to, to 
to increase its altitude. Um, and he was actually, at that point, he was trying to find a new landing site because they had already kind of bypassed the one they were supposed to land at. And I think he redesignated like seven times landing site. But you'll see the pitch kind of starts going crazy here. It's because the thrusters are on the bottom of the lander, so changing the pitch actually changes um, how fast the lander is going down. Control, they're starting to talk about low level. Low level means the, the, the amount of fuel that's left. You can hear that it's a, kind of an echo because you're actually hearing the mission team in both um, audio streams. It's 60, 60 seconds, that's the amount of fuel that's left before they either have to land or abort the mission. Picking up some dust is uh, the, off the lunar surface. So look at the pitch. I don't know if you can see it from the back. Thirty seconds of fuel left. I mean, that's the first touchdown. Okay, engine stop. 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 <laughs> okay, I'm just going to stop it there. Um, but there's so much going on here. We have all these sources we're trying to bring together um, to try to understand um, this um, complex kind of uh, aggregation of, of humans and machines working together. Um, you know, we even have, and I, I guess I, I turned it off, but... Um, oops. So th there's, some, there's some interview pieces from Aldrin and Armstrong, which are pretty nice. At one point, Armstrong admits that he was a little spastic in the final approach. Um, and, and Norman Mailer, the writer who was observing, described the lander as skittering like a water bug, deba debating which pad it will light on. So um, what's, what, what we liked about this is that it conveyed the pace and the rhythm of the event. Um, you get a nice contrast between what's happening in the pitch, um, where you actually see how the vehicle is maneuvering, and, um, and what you're able to get out of the transcript. You know, the, the, this was also broadcast live on television, so they tried to be quite subtle in their um, kind of indications of, of what might be going wrong and their communication with one another. And there was actually, you might know, but um, there was a lot of tension between Aldrin and Armstrong um, um, over the years. Um, and really we see this as a story of a professional struggle. Um, Armstrong, again, like, um, like Lorenzo, trying to be a manager of, of systems and data, but also of, of people. Um, he saw himself as a pilot, got his early, in his early career as a test pilot, and he, and he actually had wanted to manually, quote unquote, land the, land the module uh, land the lunar, lunar module, um, but here manual took on, and he actually did, you know, in a sense. He got to make a lot more decisions that, than they originally intended for him to make. It was supposed to be automated for the most part. Um, but manual meant something very specific in this socio-technical con context where he was able to kind of, um, you know, uh, continually redesignate the land, landing site for the, for the computer. He was able to control the pitch. Um, so I won't get into in kind of too much detail exactly um, 
um, all, the, all those details, but because I, I have some other projects I want to show, but, um, but we're able to get a lot out of this that, that weren't able to get out of, out of the text. Um, of course, some things are intentionally left out, um, and, and in part that's because it's meant to be what I'd call a, um, a dialogical representation in Brecht's sense of the word, um, as opposed to, you know, let's say, a simulation of the lunar landing. It really shows you how, um, how these, these data sets are brought together um, and, and reveals to a certain degree some of the gaps among them. Um, there are other sources, of course, that could have en enriched this story or allow for different stories to be told, different stories to emerge. Um, you know, there are other sources of imagery that we had. Um, there's biographical data that's kind of interesting to take into account about the training of Aldrin and Armstrong. Um, and all that goes into the broader, the broader study, the broader analysis. But this allows us to kind of see a particular event. Um, Often people ask about this, so um, did you learn anything new from doing it? Um, well, I learned everything that I know about the landing from building this. So for me, certainly. Um, but I think for Mindell, it was, um, it was obviously a different experience. You know, it was certainly a kind of confirmation of what he thought he knew by kind of pouring over transcripts and endless sheets of data, printouts. Um, but it also allowed him to communicate his research to a broader audience. Um, and we really saw in this the potential to look at a lot of different types of, um, in this case, technical work and how they unfold. And we actually, in, in, the, in the surgery example that I gave at the beginning, we thought a lot about, I, that was part of a larger process to build this type of visualization for, um, uh, for surgeries. And we, and we wrote uh, and published a bit about that, if you're interested. Um, Let's see. Um, the, uh, another big benefit of this for me is I actually got to meet Buzz, Al Buzz Aldrin and, and talk with him. He, uh, he made sure to tell me that, that uh, Armstrong wouldn't like it because uh, it would reveal all his mistakes. <laughs> um, Aldrin actually had a, he had a PhD uh, and he had designed some of the maneuvers, and uh, he was, you know, famously jealous of Armstrong for being the mission commander. Um, you know, I, we know from theorists of uh, uh, of education that ma that making certainly has educational benefits, and so for me, I think um, this raises the question: Can a design project, can a kind of making project, be at the heart of? Uh, of, of social research, can it help? Can we build things to help us learn about um, how people behave and interact? Um, so another example that I want to show you. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Is a project called the Life and Death of Metadata. Um, this is a project I worked on um, um, with a student of mine, Christelle Denis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the... This is an online project. So this is a project in a very different domain. Um, this is a project about an arboretum in, located in Boston called the Arnold Arboretum. Um, it's another example of what I call a data documentary. And I think it goes a step further from the Apollo project in that it tries to bring together the, the text. You know, in that case, we had Mindell's text, and then we had the visualization. And obviously, there were, very, there were various text, textual sources that entered into it. But here, um, really tried to bring together what we think of as a kind of traditional essay on one hand um, and a data visualization on the other. So this is a visualization of all the accessions to the, the Arnold Arboretum um, over um, a period that started in 1872 when the, 
you know, to the present, or at least till 2012, um, and tries to reveal some of the patterns of collecting and how they changed over time. And, and pairs with that um, an essay that draws on interviews with people like Peter Del Tredici, um, who helped to um, collect some of these plants. And here, here are some of the plants that he collected, brought to the Arboretum. Um, and you can hover over to see some of those. Um, this, is a, this is a project that deals with metadata as opposed to you know, data. And we want to ask, OK, you know, what does that mean? You know, metadata are really just another kind of data. Um, sometimes we talk about them as data about data. But they're data that help us categorize things often. They're kind of details about um, objects that we might collect. In this case, it's metadata about plants. But most of this metadata is really just what the uh, Arboretum staff would call accessions data. It's data about where these plants came from, when they were collected. Um, it details um, various nomenclatures that are applied to the plants. Um, and the essay allows us to, to look at, instead of just the work of a particular team, to really see kind of the life of an institution through its data um, and to filter that data in different ways. So for instance, um, at, at a certain, as you move through the essay, you start to see the, the data set filtered in different ways. Here we see um, what's called provenance type uh, at the Arboretum, which means um, uh, where did these plants come from? And, and you can see that the, the green ones are actually plants collected from the wild. The black ones are cultivated plants, so that they're coming from nurseries or other collections. The yellow are cuttings from wild plants. Um, and the gray are unknown. Actually, there are quite a bit of plants that have existed there that they have the records for still, that they don't necessarily know where they came from. And um, as you scroll through that, you can get a more detailed view of um, where all these accessions came from. But you can also get this macro view where you see um, practices changing. So you see early in the life of the Arboretum, um, there's a kind of strip of uh, plants from nurseries. Um, but there's a lot of green in there. That means they were collecting in the wild quite a bit. This is when the Arboretum was founded. It was really founded as a scientific institution, a place for exploration, a, a place to kind of bring back um, species, specimens from all over the world. Um, and and in, the, in the 20s, um, they got into a heated battle with the USDA because it turned out that they were bringing back invasive insects along with some of those plants. And, and um, the government actually shut down all of their um, wild collecting practices abroad. And so you can see that if you kind of squint in the middle, in the middle stripe in the 20th century, the Arboretum really changed into um, a place for horticulture uh, more than scientific collecting. Um, and then it wasn't until the centennial of the Arboretum in the 70s that it really, uh, that exploring opened up again. And the research activities of, of Harvard University, which, um, which runs the Arboretum, shifted from its main campus back to the Arboretum, where they're now hosted. So you get to see this, the life of the institution through this data. Um, let's see here. Uh, so I think there are, th there are really three insights that came out of doing this work. One is, you know, as I said, to, to, to highlight the work of, of an institution, to, to understand how practices of data collecting change over time. Um, and I don't just mean what they collected, but also how they recorded um, information about those, those plants. And, and I can talk about that a little if we have time. Um, the second is um, to really prototype a new form of social scholarship, a new form of social research that would bring together data and text um, in an interactive way that would allow you to um, explore this rich data set and then also learn about how it was made. Uh, and then finally, um, I think one of the things that's also now driving the work that I currently do in my lab, uh, it's a, a discovery about the localness of data, about how data um, is made, um, how, it, how it gets its shape um, by, the, by the, the forces that, 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 um, that come into play in the place it's made. Um, and I don't think we have time for me to go too much into the kind of details of that. Um, but there are all kinds of interesting uh, 
um, histories in the Arboretum. And I invite you to visit lifeanddeathofdata.org and look at some of the stories. Particularly, there's a story about the hemlock trees, um, this tree here. And um, here you can see all the hemlocks. And you can see that there were a huge number of hemlocks um, that were brought into the collection, these Canadian hemlocks. Um, and um, these actually have kind of an interesting, there's an interesting story about, about their data and why it looks the way it does. Um, it has to do with the fact that those hemlocks were actually on the grounds at the time that they were accessioned. And they were kind of accessioned all at once in order to kind of study how they were responding to an invasive bug, the woolly adelgid. Um, and, and so there are all kinds of wonderful stories in here about why the Arboretum makes data in the way that it does. Let's go back. So here's the hemlock tree. Here's its data. Um, these, these are all the accessions data. This is actually what the data looks like on the tree. Um, they use these credit card printers in order to create these tags for the tree. Um, so I was just, as I was saying, one of, the, one of the big findings of this project was the degree to which data are local. And I think we all know this. You know, we talk about data as being universal. I mean, obviously, the digital, the aspiration of the digital is that it's universal, that it's kind of independent of any place or material substrate. But really, data are always created by people using specialized practices at a particular time, in a place, with the tools at hand, in existing organizations to serve very specific audiences. And as we try to move data um, from one place to another, um, all kinds of problems um, come up, problems of interpretation, problems of interoperability, and, and, and these are a lot of the problems and the challenges that, that we look at in, uh, in the um, local data design lab. How do we understand and reconcile data that are made in different places? And of course, um, you know, I think this relates to big data in, in important ways. Often big data are aggregated from heterogeneous data sets. Um, that are made um, at different times by different people. Um, how, do we, how do we express, how do we visualize that? How do we, un how do we understand the work of putting big data together and also the work of interpreting it? And we found that um, it's in these kind of aggregated data sets, um, and here are some examples, um, where we're really able to actually more, most fully see the local aspects of data because you get to see, um, you get a comparative view of data. You, you get a sense of, um, for instance, if we take the Digital Public Library of America, how have different libraries across the country made records for books in different ways? And why does that matter? How does, how does that, that pro the provenance of the data um, matter? What are, you know, if we try to normalize that data, um, are there social histories that we're overwriting or things we're losing? Um, Zillow.com is another one you probably have interacted with that aggregates housing data from all over the world. Um, so the, I think these kinds of projects offer uh, an opportunity to understand um, data in new ways by looking not just at a, a single data but set, but aggregates. Um, so I just want to kind of summarize and end and maybe offer a chance for some questions. Um, I really see this work um, responding to a pervasive problem that practitioners are struggling to accommodate new kinds of data in their work. They deal with data that overflows paper charts, that resists description in, in text, um, in the kinds of um, text that we've produced as social researchers for many years, um, and that defies static representation, static media. And I think social researchers who are interested in understanding contemporary practice um, have to adapt some way into these new conditions. Um, we don't have to give up, of course, traditions of qualitative research. We don't have to give up um, incremental analysis and you know, bibliocentric publishing, but we have to expand them. We have to expand them to accommodate, um, accommodate data and, and its role in contemporary work. I, I believe, really, that we can design new kinds of studies, new ways of studying data that, on one hand, enrich our understanding of work in the contemporary moment, and also that help us to imagine alternatives, help us imagine futures for data and for skilled humans. So I'll just stop there and hopefully have a couple questions.
those, those two narr data narratives that you showed were beautiful. Um, I imagine they took some time. They were uh, they took a little bit of effort to do, um, and the data sets are a little bit old. But now that we're generating so much data so frequently, you know, what's the barrier? What barrier to entry do we have to overcome for people to be able to tell these narratives more frequently um, and kind of put it in the tools of the people who can explain the data? Mm, well, I think you bring up some really interesting points. One is um, kind of putting it in the hands of people who can interpret the data. I found in these kinds of projects, I always had to work very closely with people for whom this data indexes local knowledge, that it's tied to something they know about through experience. Um, and so um, I think you know, we're always going to have to do that for data. So I think there's, there's that obstacle that we always have to think about. Where does this data come from? Who made it? And who's in the best position to understand and interpret it? So I think that's one obstacle, is kind of making those relationships, um, those collaborations that enable this kind of work. And the other, uh, the other obstacles are, you know, have to do with, on one hand, the kind of technical um, problems of programming these kinds of visualizations. These are visualizations that are made without templates. They're made from scratch. Um, I'm, I'm kind of not such a big believer in kind of um, packaged visualization, but that's also because I'm interested in kind of discovering new forms of representation. Um, I, don't, I don't think for every problem you have to have a totally unique visualization. Um, and, and along with kind of discovering these new forms comes um, a need for design skills that are independent of, of programming skills. Um, and you know, a lot of people, when I say that my background is in architecture, a lot of people think, oh, well, so you know how to make buildings. Well, actually, I, I don't know much about making buildings because you don't learn how to make buildings in architecture school. You learn how to represent them. So you learn how to visualize data. And, and it's just a matter of applying that to new domains. Any other questions? Yeah? So you say data is local, but <clears throat> for instance, at Google with the um, with the with their with their mapping, right, uh, having the car drive around the entire world and having guys with the cameras on their backpacks hiking. Like, uh -huh. what, what do you what do you think about yeah. large scale sort yeah. of uh, data collection? Uh, yeah, well, that's a fascinating question. Or sort of ch challenging, like it might be local. Yeah. I mean, anybody who has looked at Google Earth before can see the heterogeneity. You know, there are different levels of resolution. There are, um, you know, all kinds of different, um, you know, these satellite images are coming from different sources at different times. Um, sometimes they're overlaid in, in kind of peculiar ways. Um, so there's a lot of heterogeneity there. And when I say that data are local, I don't mean that they can't go anywhere. Um, I just mean that they always retain traces of the places and the times and the instruments through which they're made. And those things should condition how we understand data. So we look at it not as just a homogeneous pile of information, but really something that's tied to specific kinds of practices and times and might need knowledge of those in order to kind of fully make sense of it. Um, so, so, you know, Google, Google also does a lot to try to make its data appear normal, um, normalized. Like if you look at Google Earth again, you notice strangely that there are no clouds anywhere and it's always summer and it's always the middle of the day. Well, that's not how the world looks. Um, and, 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 and once you start to notice these things, the artifice of it all becomes kind of very apparent. Um, and you realize that, that it's no longer objectivity, what you're getting from Google Earth, but it's very much a kind of construction that's based upon what it thinks our expectations are, um, and, and kind of stitching together all these heterogeneous pieces in order to kind of make it work, to present this seemingly seamless thing. Yeah? So to what degree do you think your work is trying to get at the subjectivity data, mm. right, and data creation, and then just to follow up on that, uh, thinking along those lines, have you tied your work back into the work of Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions? Sure, I mean, Kuhn, um, 
you know, built a foundation for a lot of the work that's done in, in um, um, social studies of science and technology today. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, I think his notion of like the paradigm shift um, is, you know, is flawed in certain key ways. And I think, you know, foremost among those, and I think which fits very well into the kind of subjectivity of data, is that um, even as our kind of theories and experiments may, um, may stay the same, our instruments are constantly changing. They're being updated, they're higher resolution, um, and we have to kind of integrate that new data. Um, so there's a kind of, this is something that Peter Gallison has written a lot about. He calls it like this intercalated progress in science where you get, instead of getting these huge shifts that you get these smaller shifts, which actually help to create this kind of these local qualities in data. Another person that's written about this is Paul Edwards, he wrote a book called *The Vast Machine* about how climate change models are built, and they those models have to integrate data from all over the world, of course, but also from instruments made by different companies at different times. There's a lot of normalization that has to go on, this, and uh, so so. People who work in those projects, of course, appreciate and understand that heterogeneity. But uh, I think the biggest problem um, is for lay people um, who, don't ha who aren't trained as engineers or scientists that are asked to use data in decision making. And they don't have a sense, they don't have that data literacy. They don't have a sense of where data come from. So when they open up Zillow and they're looking at housing prices, for instance, um, they don't have a sense of the kind of normalization that goes on in order to kind of show them a picture of the housing market. Um, and so I think we need uh, a new level of literacy around data. Um, and that's kind of where, where some of my new work is going. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Sure. We, I think we're right at one. So okay. Let's take you again. Yeah, thanks.